What's good, everybody? Welcome to the first episode of Grand Theories. I am your host, Mark. This is a podcast where we explore lesser known ideas that try to explain really big things about the world we live in. And for this first episode, I thought it might be appropriate to look at a school of thought that I don't think can get much bigger. It's from the world of philosophy, and it's called Cosmos Psychism. And your standard Cosmos Psychist would hold the view that the universe is a conscious being, a being that's sentient, aware of itself and its surroundings, and possibly controls its own actions. Now, I know this sounds a bit New Age-ish, But the fact is that cosmopsychism is backed by philosophy, as well as some newer scientific developments. So today we'll take a good, hard look at cosmopsychism, what it entails, why it may be true, and what it could mean for humans and the world around us. Now before we start talking about a conscious universe, we need to take a few minutes and get a grip on consciousness itself. I think it's safe to say that you, me, just about anybody listening to this can at least understand in their own mind what consciousness feels like or what it means to you personally. But the true fact is that even though study about consciousness has come quite some ways over the years, science really still has no clue what exactly it is. To illustrate just how messy consciousness can get, let's take one hypothetical line of reasoning. Imagine yourself in a distant future where cloning technology is at its peak. So there would be a capability to clone oneself, and this clone is literally the same exact thing down past the DNA. Every atom, every quark, every electron, it's all the same. Now, if I decided to clone myself for whatever reason, would that clone be conscious? On one hand, I would think, if it's exactly like me in every single aspect, then of course it would be conscious. But on the other hand, I might think, of course it's not conscious. I'm me. I have a soul. I'm unique. There's no me in some clone. But maybe this idea doesn't sit too well with me. After all, your your soul, your consciousness, it has to be made of something. And if this clone, it's, it's the same, then it has to be conscious, right? So then I start thinking about other people and their consciousness and what their souls are made of. And I start to wonder, wouldn't it all just be made from the same stuff? then that might mean that my soul is not really mine, but it's just some some thing that everybody has, every human has inside of them. But then it begs the question, if it's all the same, is everything me? Before you write me off as a narcissist, I just wanted to show how difficult it can be to reason about consciousness. It can put you in a hole pretty quick. And this is what consciousness theorists have been dealing with for hundreds and hundreds of years. Now, our understanding of consciousness has advanced a lot, uh, especially with the advents of science, but we're still pretty far away from really getting it. And this dilemma has been summed up pretty nicely by a gentleman named David Chalmers. David Chalmers is both a philosopher and a neuroscientist. And in the mid-90s, he introduced the concept of the easy and hard problems of consciousness. What the easy problems are, are the things about consciousness that we figured out scientifically. These are mostly task-oriented processes that can be linked to brain activity. So for example, being able to differentiate between a square and a circle being able to focus on a task, being able to move your hand or leg 
or reacting to something like a pinprick. So it's these types of cognitive elements that we tie to consciousness that we pretty well understand. The hard problem of consciousness is explaining these deeper elements of our inner life called qualia. And at a very high level, what qualia are, are our experiences or our awareness of our consciousness and our conscious states. So these would include the experience or what it's like to see the color blue, the experience of feeling sad, or my favorite, awareness of being aware. So it's these type of secondary experiential elements of consciousness that we still don't understand. An MRI won't tell you how these work. Now I can spend hours and hours talking about the different views on the meaning of consciousness and what it is, but I'm going to try and summarize it really quickly here. Much of the historical debate on this topic revolves around something called the mind-body problem. And this problem comes up when asking the question, is consciousness part of the body, or is consciousness its own special, immaterial thing? And most people who study consciousness broadly will fall into one of two camps related to this problem. The first school of thought here is called dualism. And what a dualist would hold is that consciousness is separate from the body. In essence, it's the belief of having a soul. This view was very popular for a long time when philosophy had a hold over the study of consciousness. One of the most famous dualists was René Descartes. Now, dualism lost its way as science advanced, as our ability to study the brain and the body got better. And this is where the materialist view became increasingly popular. And what a materialist would hold is that consciousness is part of the body and is inseparable from the body. So in that sense, we could not have a soul that would leave the body upon death. Now, materialism is arguably the wider-held view today, which isn't too surprising, considering that we can map so many conscious states to brain activity. And as I said, as a general rule, most people would fall into either the dualist or materialist camp. But there is a third school of thought, and that idea is called panpsychism. And what a panpsychist would hold is that consciousness is not limited to humans, animals, and living things, but that non-living, inanimate, inorganic objects can be conscious as well. And within panpsychism, there's a wide range of opinions on what exactly can be conscious, but things like rocks, tables, atoms, and electrons can hold consciousness in some form. Now, as you may have guessed, panpsychism is not a mainstream view. There are certainly more dualists and more materialists out there. And I would attribute that to two primary reasons. The first and perhaps most obvious reason is that panpsychism is counterintuitive to our senses in every way. We have no empirical evidence to suggest that it would be true. The second, and I would say deeper reason, is that panpsychism de-emphasizes humanity. In dualism and materialism, humans are still top dog, in a sense. Some dualists, including Descartes, would argue that humans are the only thing that have consciousness. Your typical materialist would probably argue that some animals can be conscious, but they're probably not going much further than that. In panpsychism, Consciousness isn't really a commodity anymore. If boron atoms and doors are now just as conscious as we are, or even just half as conscious, our stock falls a little bit. But whether we like it or not, 
there's still so much that we don't understand. There's still a lot of room left for panpsychism in the grand scheme of it all. Let's jump back to David Chalmers for a second. Chalmers is one of many consciousness specialists who's talked about an idea akin to degrees of consciousness, or consciousness having fundamental parts. So just as all the material things in the universe are made up of atoms, consciousness, in this sense, would have its own elementary particles. So while there's no evidence of what consciousness might be made up of, the idea itself opens up a big door for panpsychist views. So in this view, consciousness would have differing levels of complexity, depending on how many of these particles it's composed of. So in this view, it's perfectly valid for worms, for example, to be conscious. But due to the fact that they don't have as many of these consciousness elements in their composition, their experience of consciousness is much more shallow than ours. Now, if you take this view all the way down to the bottom, it is entirely possible that atoms themselves, or even electrons, could be conscious. And in that case, panpsychism makes a whole lot more sense. And if you move in the opposite direction, take this view all the way up, cosmopsychism is born. In late 2018, a young philosopher named Philip Goff published a paper titled, Did the Universe Design Itself? And in the paper, Goff reasons himself into the conclusion that the universe consciously selected its own attributes and composition in the earliest moments in time. Now, this is a pretty boisterous conclusion, but the paper was actually pretty short, and the argument relatively simple. And the paper starts off as an attempt to explain what is called the fine-tuning of the universe. What this boils down to is that in order for life to be able to exist within our universe, there are a number of elements within the physical laws that govern it that have to fit into a very narrow range of values. More simply put, is that when this universe began, we hit the jackpot over and over and over again. To understand this in a little more detail, let's use one of Goff's examples the strong nuclear force. The strong nuclear force is what keeps atoms bound together. So if it didn't exist, well, nothing would really exist. And as Goff puts it, if the strong nuclear force had just been incrementally bigger or smaller, the atoms in the early universe would not have developed in a way that led to planets, stars, and ultimately life. And this is just one of many physical constants that falls in a very precise range as to allow life to develop in the universe. And what fine-tuning advocates argue is that the chance of all of that happening in this way was so, so low that it couldn't have been random. And in essence, something made the universe like this. And what Goff does next is go over the two most common explanations for fine-tuning. Number one is theism, that a benevolent, all-knowing, all-powerful God created our universe in a way that allowed life to thrive. Now, many people across our planet are familiar with this idea, but it's the second explanation that might not be as well-known. And this is the multiverse hypothesis. And the multiverse is an idea that is rooted in physics and is advocated for by some physicists. And what it states is that our universe, essentially everything created by the Big Bang, is just one of many, perhaps infinite, universes. Now, when I first heard this, it messed me up pretty bad, because I always thought of the universe, by definition, as everything and anything that you could possibly imagine. 
but apparently there can be many universes outside of our own. And one helpful way to think of it is a universe being something that has its own history and perhaps its own laws of physics, which may differ from ours quite significantly. So in our case, if you accept that the Big Bang created everything, our universe would be everything that comes from that specific Big Bang. Now to make this even more confusing, there's more than one idea of how the multiverse might work. In the version that Goff's talking about, there are a very large number of other universes outside of our own, possibly infinite. These universes may or may not be different. They likely are. There's not a real idea of how their composition is determined, but in this case it's assumed that it's random. And it's at this point where Goff proposes a third possible solution, the cosmos psychist view. Now Goff doesn't paint a perfectly clear picture of what a conscious universe might look like, but he does, for the purpose of his argument, make a few assumptions. And these include that it has basic faculties for reasoning. It is rational by nature. It has recognized life as being something of value. Being rational and seeing the value in life, it ultimately chose to design itself in a way that would allow life to thrive. And finally, he proposes that it has limited power to control the events that occur within itself. Now it's at this point where Goff goes into a fairly deep philosophical argument to explain why this solution is better than theism or the multiverse. Now I'm going to paraphrase the rest of the paper, but what Goff essentially does is argue for and select cosmopsychism as the superior explanation for fine-tuning. And his reasoning is ultimately that the theory of cosmopsychism, when laid out, is much simpler and cleaner than that of theism and the multiverse hypothesis. Frankly, very few in academia have been willing to argue for cosmopsychism, and Goff was easily the most serious that I could find. And this shouldn't surprise any of us, because the consciousness of the universe is something that we can't study, predict, test, or really scientifically look at in any way. Philosophy is the only tool that we have available at this moment to look at it, and even that, as we've seen, is really difficult to do. But even though cosmopsychism is all but absent from academia, this type of holist, monist view is not that uncommon in the real world. In religions like Hinduism, Taoism, Christianity, and others, you'll pretty commonly hear the idea of everything being unified by an eternal energy or God, even. If you talk to anybody who's taken a significant dose of any psychedelic substance, such as LSD, many of them will tell you that we're all one, everything is love, or even that the universe is alive. And even in the world of science, this idea is becoming more and more real. Take quantum physics, for example. Now, this is a subject I would really like to avoid having to explain on this podcast, just because it's so damn confusing. But in essence, quantum physicists study things at the subatomic level. So atoms, electrons, neutrons, protons, and quarks. Very small things. And essentially what happens is... Once you start observing particles at this level, things get really weird. The normal laws of physics that we know, like gravity, electromagnetism, these things break down and no longer work. In quantum physics, particles can become entangled with each other after some sort of physical interaction. Once two particles enter this state, they become unified and will remain unified with one another even across great distances and great amounts of time. Now, entanglement is a pretty interesting topic that is probably best suited for exploring in another episode of this podcast. But what this and these other examples show is that there's a lot of room for this unity and connection 
that the idea that Goff's put forward of a conscious universe would require in order to be true. Now, getting back to Goff, even though he did put forward a couple of attributes of his conscious universe, it was a little bit disappointing that he didn't dive further into what it would look like exactly and what it would mean for the day-to-day of humanity. Now, I can't blame the man. He is a philosopher. That's his job. He works in a university. In order to get published, you can't be too cartoonish, and you have to stay within certain bounds in your articles. But lucky for me, I'm not an academic, I'm not a philosopher, and this isn't my job. I'm just a guy who does a podcast. So, in reality, I can do whatever I want. And I think I'm going to do what Goff didn't do. In 2004, Alexander Wendt, who is an international relations scholar who relentlessly pushes the bounds of his field, asked the question, are nations living organisms? And surprisingly enough, this question has been asked for hundreds of years. People like Hegel and Kant were among the first to try to answer it. And in attempting to put his own unique stamp on it, Wendt asked an additional question. Are nations conscious? And in laying out the answers to these questions, he made a few points that are going to help us with our bigger problem of universal consciousness. Firstly, one determined that nations ultimately lack the fundamental properties that would be required in order to consider them a form of biological life. So even though he proposed that states could partake in homeostasis through things like crafting laws, policies, or programs, He said that they don't do certain things like genetically reproduce and thus can't be classified as organisms. So while organisms might be a stretch, one does make the claim that they could be considered a type of superorganism. And a superorganism is something like a beehive or ant colony, basically a group of living organisms that cooperate and synchronize with each other in such a way with every unit having a distinct purpose, that they act and function much like a single organism would. So just as an ant colony might make a decision to build an anthill in a new location, a state may make a decision to enact a new tax policy simply based off the desires of the citizens that make it up. Another thing that Wundt does is open the door for national consciousness to be considered as a property that emerges out of the smaller parts that make it up. Consciousness as an emergent property is actually a pretty common idea within the debates on individual consciousness. And in trying to explore the potentiality of national consciousness as an emergent property, Wundt gets into examples of these ultra-complex human-wide projects. So think of things like the Large Hadron Collider or Google. These are the types of things that are so complicated in their nature and structure that not one single person that works on them can understand every aspect of it 100% to a T. Therefore, you could suggest that the Large Hadron Collider, for example, would not exist or even function without the brain power and the efforts of many people. So in that sense, it's not reducible to one single person. In that sense, you could also say that the Large Hadron Collider emerged out of a bunch of smaller parts, in this case, people. So one ultimately concludes that nations, unsurprisingly, don't possess this type of emergent consciousness as we're talking about it. So even though nations can show hints of a type of group consciousness through consensus or majority opinion, being able to experience what it's like to be a nation is not something that's currently feasible or possible.
So even though nations themselves aren't conscious, we can still try to get an idea of what an emergent group-wide consciousness could look like. And to do that, we need to dive into another big idea, the Gaia hypothesis. The Gaia Hypothesis was introduced by a scientist and an environmentalist named James Lovelock. And what his ultimate proposal was is that the entire composition of the Earth, the rocks, oceans, mountains, deserts, the life that lives on it, even humans, form a complex, planet-wide superorganism. And in his initial paper, Lovelock supported the idea using evidence from geological and atmospheric history, showing how the Earth had balanced itself out throughout millions of years of existence. Now, it's difficult to get an impression of how all of this works just by reading through the evidence that he puts forward. So Lovelock does cite an illustrative hypothetical example called Daisy World. Imagine a cloudless, featureless planet that has only two species of organisms, white daisies and black daisies. This planet orbits a sun whose energy output naturally varies over a long period of time. The black daisies, which will naturally absorb a considerable amount of warmth and light just due to their color, don't need a lot of sun and will grow ideally in cooler temperatures. White daisies, which will naturally reflect away much more sunlight compared to the black daisies, need more light to thrive and thus will do better when it's hot. So during periods in the sun's life cycle when it's especially warm, black daisies will tend to die out while the white daisies do quite well. So as the amount of white daisies continues to increase and black daisies continue to decrease, more and more sunlight ends up being reflected away, thus steadily decreasing the average surface temperature of the planet. So as the temperature steadily goes down, the black daisies start emerging again and things balance themselves out. And this effect will work inversely as well during times when the sun's output is diminished. And what this ultimately functions as is a homeostatic balancing act that will never allow the temperature on the surface of this planet to get too hot or too cold. Now a number of computer simulations were run on Daisy World using a variety of initial and fluctuating conditions. And each time, the same result occurred. A constant tendency toward this ideal, balanced temperature. So even though Daisy World is limited to our imagination, Lovelock's proposal is that the Earth works in a very similar but much more complicated way. Now Lovelock didn't touch the subject of consciousness in his original paper. But over the years, other Gaia hypothesists have brought that concept into the fold, suggesting that the Earth might be consciously doing these things. As you can guess, this idea is largely rejected. There's no real evidence to suggest it, and it can't be scientifically tested. But structurally, this model of Gaian consciousness gives us some glimpse of a very small-scale, universal consciousness. A complex system of organic and inorganic objects, humans included, doubling as aspects of this living Earth. Units working together amidst the illusion of separateness and competition to create an emergent, conscious superorganism larger than itself. Consciousness serving consciousness. One of the last questions that we need to address in this wider exercise 
is what is it that life is doing here in the universe? And I don't mean something along the lines of, did anything put us here? And if so, who or what? We can set that one aside for now. But what I mean is, what is it that life is aiming for? There's a fairly well-viewed video on YouTube of a nine-year-old boy who's discussing his thoughts on the meaning of life. And he brilliantly describes the lengthy, inherent journey of biological life as, quote, an endless quest without knowing what the quest is. Now, to put forward my own understanding of how a cosmos psychist universe might look, I need to attempt to propose what this quest might be. One of the key biological properties of life is a constant effort to grow and develop. This is something that we've seen over the course of life on Earth, and while scientists still don't agree on all the details, we know that life did start out as tiny, simple, single-celled organisms. And this was the extent of it all for a couple billion years. And eventually, somehow, these single-celled organisms evolved into multicellular, more complex life. And since then, life has continued to grow, to develop, and ultimately to become more and more conscious and capable. And while we aren't given any particular objective or aim or mandate when we enter this life, I would say that just about everyone would probably agree that humans and life strive not only to survive and maintain their environment, but to continually improve their respective situations. We can see an example of this in the way that humanity tends to measure its progress. Things like production, technological advancement, computing power, ability to harness the energy around us, and economic improvement are all seen as signs of our societal upward arc. And this deep-rooted desire for progress is well summed up by the philosopher Arthur Schopenhauer, who says, quote, All striving comes from lack, from a dissatisfaction with one's condition, and is thus suffering as long as it is not satisfied. But no satisfaction is lasting. Instead, it is only the beginning of a new striving. End quote. Many see this striving as perhaps the main primary determinant in trying to figure out where life is ultimately going to go. And perhaps one of the biggest proponents of that idea is a Russian astronomer named Nikolai Kardashev. Nikolai Kardashev, during the space race, developed something called the Kardashev Scale. And what his scale does is attempt to measure how evolved a civilization is simply based on their overall capacity to control energy. And within his scale, he proposes three types of civilizations. The simplest type on his scale is called a Type 1 civilization. And a Type 1 is capable of utilizing all the energy available on their home planet. Now, in the 70s, our good friend Carl Sagan calculated this out and estimated that human civilization fell at about a 0.7 on that scale. And this is through our ability to control and use a variety of types of energy from the Earth. So things like fossil fuels, wind energy, solar energy, etc. Astrophysicist Michio Kaku estimates that for us to get from a 0.7 to a type 1 will take about another 100 to 200 years. Up next is a type 2 civilization, which is capable of utilizing the energy available from its nearest sun. Now, in our case, this is a pretty long ways off, and it's even difficult to conceive of how we might even do that. The estimate to get here, according to Michio Kaku, is a few thousand years. 
Due to the exponential math that Kardashev's scale is constructed upon, the next jump to a Type 3 civilization is pretty dramatic. These types of societies can harness the power of an entire galaxy. And at this point, forming a picture in one's head of how this might work can put great strain on the limits of human creativity. We would likely need to harness the power of objects like black holes, quasars, and even dark energy. And as outlandish as the entire concept may sound, the idea of a Type 3 is actually taken pretty seriously. So much so that there are academic studies that have been conducted to search for them. Michio Kaku estimates it would take humanity at least another 100,000 years to get here. Kardashev chose at this point not to go any further and to stop his scale. Perhaps he thought it was testing the limits of possibility just a little too much. But there are others that have picked up where he left off. And this is where we meet the Type 4 civilization. That type controls the energy of an entire universe. Now, some argue that if such a civilization did exist, we wouldn't even know it, as our minds would very likely not be able to understand what it would even look like. And it's here where we can finally round the corner and come home with this entire idea of cosmopsychism. You see, when I first really thought hard about the concept itself, the concept of a conscious universe, I thought that one way to explain my awareness, my consciousness in my own life as a human, would be the universe wanting to zoom downward and experience a very small part of itself. But upon really thinking about it more, I kind of set that idea aside as I don't think it would be the most logical manifestation of a cosmopsychist universe. It's not the universe wanting to experience itself, but life wanting to experience the universe. Now, if we accept life's arc as moving toward the destiny of becoming a type four, we would need to account for the vast, unfathomably large distances that civilization would have to have control over. Now, of course, there would be plenty of new technologies that would account for a lot of that. But it seems logical that some type of instantaneously available consciousness that connects everything and anything would be a monumental advantage for managing and overseeing the masses and masses and seemingly endless masses of content that composes the entire universe. So in one sense, becoming this conscious universe-wide superorganism that's aligned and connected in every single way would seem almost a prerequisite for a Type 4 civilization. And in theory, such a consciousness would flow through everything. Atoms, worms, tables, planets, black holes, plants, galaxies, and humans. Or whatever humans have evolved into, if we're still around. Could it be that our continual drive to grow and evolve is simply rooted in a deep desire to want to know what it feels like to be conscious of everything. Could this be our quest? To emerge into the ultimate conscious being? Now, I can't take credit as the first person to propose this idea. It goes as far back as the Mayans, who thought of universal consciousness as a final step in the evolution of humanity. Jumping back earlier into the episode onto quantum physics. Remember the thing I didn't want to try and explain? Well, within quantum physics, there is a semi-controversial and ultimately panpsychist hypothesis that 
predicts that there are small elements of consciousness that exist deep within the functioning of subatomic particles. And if that is true, it is also true that consciousness exists within everything. And if you dig deeper into this idea, it's proposed that our consciousness as human beings exists within the neurons of our brain in these very small structures called microtubules. And I'm going to sidestep explaining the technical details of how exactly that's supposed to work. But it can ultimately be summed up that these structures are an ideal environment for these conscious elements of these particles to interact with and entangle in each other in such a way that humans experience consciousness in a more connected, wider, and deeper manner. Now, if you're still there, try and stay with me just a little bit longer, because we're going to go deeper into quantum consciousness to an idea called the quantum pleasure principle. And what this suggests is that many billions of years ago, when life was just forming on Earth as single-celled organisms, there were conscious processes within these organisms that became entangled with each other. And what this did was create not only deeper and more rewarding forms of consciousness, but it built and created an instinctual motivation to seek out these greater forms of consciousness. Simply put, the intrinsic pleasure that we get from consciousness is what drove and continues to drive life to evolve. Now, this idea, as many on this episode, is pretty controversial and as of now is completely impossible to prove. But in trying to answer the question of what we are aiming for and what our quest is in this life, it gives us a framework for one potential answer. And if it's true, it means that our quest as humans is to serve as a small part of a much larger journey toward this ultimate goal of a conscious universe. Now that sounds horrifying, essentially, but I really don't think that it's all bad. Because if consciousness is really just an object, it seems most logical to me to believe that all of us, you, me, and everyone else, is a part of it. And while your consciousness might feel separate from mine and everybody else's at this moment, it also seems logical to assume that one day, if we reached universal consciousness, it would all come together under one roof. And if that's the case, then everything would one day be me. All right, that does wrap it up for our first episode of Grand Theories. I hope you thoroughly enjoyed it. I hope you learned something new today. Uh, I had a great time putting this podcast together, and I'm going to continue to put more out in the future. Uh, If you can give me a like, a subscribe, a comment, whatever you can do to support this, I'm looking forward to many more episodes. Thank you guys for listening.